Hello, and welcome to Miami Book Fair 2020. I am Lisette Mendez, Miami Book Fair's Programs Director, and I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our sponsors and supporters, especially the Dasberg Foundation and the Knight Foundation for making today's program possible. It's always a pleasure to partner with the National Book Foundation. Since 2014, we jointly presented this teen press conference at the Miami Book Fair, and it's always a wonder to see so many students coming together. Our sincere gratitude to Lisa Lucas and to her fantastic teen book from all of us at Teen Book Fair. And now I am happy to bring on screen Jordan Smith, the foundation's deputy director. She's gonna get this conference started. Thank you so much, Lizette, and welcome to the National Book Awards Teen Press Conference. My name is Jordan Smith. I'm the Deputy Director at the National Book Foundation, where we work year-round to help connect people like all of you tuning in today with books. Um, I'm excited to welcome you to the first ever virtual teen press conference, and I'm excited to share with you that because we're having a virtual event instead of an in-person one, we're able to welcome students from both New York City and Miami-Dade County to today's event. So this Wednesday night, we'll have another exciting event, the National Book Awards. Each year, we give out awards across a few different categories with the goal of celebrating the best literature in America. Just like all of the events and programs that we're doing during the pandemic, the National Book Awards will be a virtual event, which means that everyone is invited, and we really mean everyone. We hope you will join us there, and we'll be sure to put a link into the chat to let you know how you can do so. So the National Book Awards are one way that we do this work of connecting people with books. And it's a big annual exciting event, but it's not just exciting for writers or publishers or folks from the book world, it's exciting for readers. The awards give us readers the chance to discover, learn about and celebrate books that we feel really excited to read. And today, we are here to celebrate the five books that are finalists for the National Book Award in Young People's Literature this year, and of course, the authors of these five incredible books. So if you're wondering how all of this works, each year we select a group of judges. This year, our judges read 311 books, and from that 311, picked just 10 that they thought represented the best of the year. That group of 10 is called the long list. From that long list, they then choose five, they narrow it down to five finalists, and that is who we will be hearing from today. So in advance of today, you received from your teachers who registered for the event uh, a link to a digital notebook that contained background information on each of the books and authors featured today, as well as, ex as, well as excerpts from each of those books, so you could read a little bit in advance. You also received access to a set of videos that features each of today's finalists reading from their book. We hope that those materials really helped get you jazzed to be here with us today. And during our time together during the teen press conference this morning, we'll be focusing on actually interacting with these authors through a Q&A. Some of you have already submitted questions in advance and we encourage you to keep these questions coming. We want to hear what you have to ask and you can use the chat function to do so. We're really looking forward to having a good conversation over this next uh, hour or so together. So before we get started, some thank yous. Thank you to the Miami Book Fair, who are our longtime partners and the co-presenter of today's event. Uh, thank you especially to Marcy Canciobello and Lizette Mendez, who helped us figure out how to take a decades old event and bring it to you online here today. Thanks to the 92nd Street Y, who helped us promote today's event. Thanks to the publishers who provided those excerpts that we were able to share with, that we were able to share with you in advance. Scholastic, Hofton Mifflin Harcourt, Penguin Random House, and Simon & Schuster. Thanks to my colleague, Andy Donnelly, Education Programs Manager at the National Book Foundation, who coordinated many, many details to make sure today's event could happen. And last, but certainly not least, thank you to the teachers who coordinated everything to help get students here with us today. We know this is a very difficult school year, much more challenging than any school year any of us can remember. And we are so grateful that you made the time to be here with us today and to take some time to celebrate books. And now I'm really excited to welcome our host for today, Jason Reynolds. Jason is no stranger to the Teen Press Conference, having been a finalist for the National Book Award twice for his books, Ghost and Look Both Ways. 
You might also know Jason as the author of the Newberry Honor, Prince Honor, and Coretta Scott King Honor award-winning book, Long Way Down, or the nonfiction book he co-wrote with Ibram X. Kendi, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. Or you might have seen him as the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah or on, the late, or on late Night with Seth Meyers. Lastly, you'll soon know Jason as the host of the National Book Awards happening this Wednesday. We are absolutely thrilled that Jason is here with us today to serve as our host and to help us celebrate books. And without further ado, Jason Reynolds. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning everybody. It's team press conference day. It's team press conference day. And before we get started, actually, I wanna, um, uh, before I jump into all the other things, I wanna acknowledge our wonderful uh, American Sign Language interpreter, Jason Kajawa. It's good to see you, Jason. We appreciate you, brother. It's weird to say good to see you, Jason, because my name is Jason too, and it's like, a, it's a thing, you know? But shout out to my guy, Jason. But let's get to it. Here's the thing. I Every time I'm, I'm at the press conference or in this moment I'm hosting the press conference, I, I wish, I think about myself and I wonder what, I would have, what it would have been like for me to be able to attend this when I was young. But I didn't have this. This wasn't available to me. All I had was uh, a, a telephone and, and what we used to call the phone book. Let me, let me explain. Let me, let me explain what I, what I mean. I, um, I was a young person who loved Maya Angelou. Right, Maya Angelou. And by the way, Maya Angelou was loved by everybody, right? My mama loved her. My grandmama loved her. I loved her. Uh, there's a poem on the wall in my mother's house that I didn't even know she wrote until I was much older. But like Maya Angelou always felt like sort of like the, the patron saint of poetry. She felt like, I don't know, like the master, right? And I remember being a young person and I don't remember who told me to do this, but somebody told me to look Maya Angelou up in the phone book to see if she was in there. Now, let me explain to all the young people out there what a phone book was. Back in the day before the internet, everybody used to get a book delivered to their homes called a phone book, the yellow pages or the white pages for business, right? And what this meant was every single person in America, their phone numbers and their names were printed in this book. Can you imagine? I look now that I say it and I mention it now, it seems ridiculous and dangerous, right? But back then, you could find anyone's phone number if you had the phone book just by looking through it like a dictionary and saying, okay, A, A, and, and going through, oh, and, and seeing if there's a name there, right? And next to that name would be a phone number. Now, the only way that your name wouldn't be there is if you intentionally had it deleted from the phone book, which some people did, like celebrities, right? But not everybody did that. And so I figured, well, let's take a look. My buddy said, you should just check and see if Maya Angelou's name was in the phone book. And so I look and there it is. Maya Angelou's name was in the yellow pages. And so I decide that I'm going to start calling her because I just want to talk to her and tell her how much she meant to me and see if she would uh, read some of my poems. And so I start calling every day and she never answers the phone because it turns out this is her office phone. And I think she was on like sabbatical or traveling, touring, being, you know, a legend. Right. But I called her and I called her and I called her um, until I until I finally gave up. But what I realize now is just, just the mere idea of possibly talking to Maya Angelou on the phone. Just the notion I could call her was enough to inspire me. Um, it was enough to make me feel like I could keep going and keep trying to be who she was and uh, who I someday hope to be. Um, that's what the team, press, the team press conference is really about. It's an opportunity for you all to actually engage with the people who are writing the books about your lives, the people who see you and are trying to portray you in their narratives, right? You ain't got to do it like me and be a stalker, right? You get to ask your questions right here on this platform and congratulations to you. Now, it's time for us to get into the final list. You didn't come to hear me talk about Maya Angelou or how much I love the fact that the interpreter's name is Jason. Uh, you all didn't come to hear smooth jazz. I don't know why they felt like the team press conference, it, that it was it was best to be, uh, you know, that the soundtrack should be smooth jazz. Because nothing says teenager like smooth jazz. But, you know, I think now it's time for us to jump into what you really came here for, which is to hear from the finalists for this year's National Book Awards for Young People's Literature. I'm very, very proud of this. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm so excited to see how this goes. First up, we have Case and Calendar for their book, King and the Dragonflies, a book I love, by the way. 
Kaysen was born and raised in St. Thomas of the U.S. Virgin Islands. They are the best-selling and award-winning author of Hurricane Child. This is kind of an epic love story and Felix Ever After, among other books. They currently live in Philly and enjoy playing RPG video games in their free time, which means Kaysen, Kaysen probably has a PlayStation 5. Give it up for Kaysen Calendar. Hey everyone, thank you, Jason. I actually of do not have a good day to survive yet, but I do. Oh, <laughs> oh. All right, so here we go, Kason. Can you describe, now, by the way, I want you to know I'm really excited to see you do this because I can't describe your book in one sentence, so I'm really happy to see you try to pull this off. <laughs> can you describe King and the Dragonflies in one sentence? I hope I can pull it off also. Um, I think I'd say that King and the Dragonflies is about 12 year old Kingston James, who is healing from the loss of the death of his older brother, Khalid, while also questioning his sexuality. Perfect. I, you know what, you, you pulled it off, Case, and I, <laughs> now that I think about it, I'm like, oh, that's what it is, you know? Thank you so much, <laughs> and uh, good luck to you. I'm super happy for you, congratulations. Thank you. Next up, we are going to hear from someone else whose work I'm very familiar with. Uh, you know, as a, 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 an icon in the making, give it up for the great Tracy Chi for her book, We Are Not Free. Tracy grew up in a small town with more cows than people. She lives in California. She's the best selling author of the Reader Trilogy. She describes herself as an all around word geek who loves book arts and art books, poetry and paper crafts, and dabbles in egg painting, bonsai gardening, and hosting game nights for family and friends, which basically means Tracy Chi is by far the most interesting person on the planet. Also, just as a side note, she says she has a fast dog. And that by far is the most important element of this bio. Tracy, how are you, my friend? Everything good? I am so good. Thank you so much. It's early over there, right? It's seven o'clock, seven forty. Yeah, I got to see the sunrise this morning, so that was a treat. Not a bad deal. Now, can you describe? I, I feel like this is. I feel like I'm a game show. I'm, I'm challenging you all, right? Can you describe your book, "We Are Not Free," in a single sentence? No, but um, <laughs> I to say that "We Are Not Free" is a historical novel and stories about a group of Japanese American teenagers who are uprooted from their homes and sent to live in incarceration camps in World War II, loosely inspired by some of my own family stories from that time. It's amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here. I want to extend my my congratulations to you in advance. Um, what a wonderful, wonderful book, and what a wonderful opportunity to share this time with you. Thank you. Of course, of course. Next up, we have Candice Elo. Candice Elo was the author of the book Everybody Looking, which is another brilliant book that I had the pleasure of reading a million times. Candace is a Nigerian American who has performed her poetry at the New York Poets Cafe in New York City, the Women in Poetry and Hip Hop Celebration at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum in Baltimore, and as part of the Africa in Motion Performing Art Series at the National Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C., where I live. She completed an MFA degree at Lesley University. Everybody Looking is her first novel. And she's probably waiting for me to crack a ridiculous joke about it because this is what we do every day of our lives. <laughs> but I will not do that today, buddy. This is your day. I will not do that today. <laughs> Instead, I want to ask you, first of all, are you good? How are you, my friend? I feel really good. This is a great Monday. Good. Are you looking good on the I see you with the yellow. Looking good on the yellow. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now, let, everybody wants to know, can you describe a book that, by the way, spans like 15 years of somebody's life. Can you describe it? Everybody looking at like, can you describe it in one sentence? All right, so this is a run on probably. Um, <laughs> so Everybody Looking is about a first generation Nigerian American queer teen who is coming to terms with her body and her sexuality now that she's um, kind of forced to face her childhood memories far away from home. Um, her first year at an HBCU. Nailed it. 
And for the young people out there, what she did was she put so many commas in that sentence to stretch it out. But we're going to slide today. Hey, homie, I appreciate you. I'm so proud of you and so happy for you. Congratulations in advance. All right. Thank you. All right. Next step, we have co-authors. By the way, co-authors is my jam. Collaboration is key, young people. Don't be afraid to write books together. Uh, the co-authors, Victoria Jameson and Omar Mohammed, for their book, When Stars Are Scattered. Victoria is a graphic novelist who has written All's Fair in Middle School and Roller Girl, which, by the way, I loved. She was a children's book designer and freelance illustrator and has worked as a portrait artist and aboard a cruise ship, which I used to love. She has lived in Australia, Italy, and Canada and now lives in Pennsylvania. Omar spent his childhood at the Dab camp after his father was killed and he was separated from his mother in Somalia. He devoted everything to taking care of his younger brother, Hassan, and to pursuing an education. He now lives in Pennsylvania and works at a center to help resettle other refugees. He is the founder of Refugee Strong, a nonprofit organization that empowers students living in refugee camps. Thank you both for being here, everybody. Good? Yeah, all is good. Good, 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 good. All right, now, I don't know how you all are gonna do this together, but we're gonna see how well y'all collaborate. <laughs> And you have your book when stars are scattered in one sentence. <laughs> we decided beforehand Omar is going to do it, so that's how we collaborated on this one. And uh, I think you have already said because it is just my bio you read. So the when the stars are scattered is solely based on me and my younger brother growing up in a refugee camp. My younger brother also happens to have uh, intellectual disability, so that is uh, about when the stars are scattered. And it's a true story when I say it's based on me. So that's me. Absolutely, man. Well, I want to say uh, congratulations to you both. And I want to say especially, um, Omar, that uh, I am. we all are inspired by your strength uh, and, and, and persistence. And uh, it's a true honor um, to have this moment with you. Congratulations, y'all. Thank you. And last but not least, Last but not least, we have Gabrielle Savit for his book, The Way Back. Hey. Gabrielle, there he is. All right, Gabrielle's from Ann Arbor, Michigan, a Michigander. I don't know, young people, if you know people from Michigan, we're called Michiganders, but that's what they're called, Michiganders. He is an actor and a singer with a degree in musical theater. So of course he would become a writer. He has performed on three continents, uh, from New York to Brussels to Tokyo. And he's the author of Anna and the Swallow Man, which I have read also. And it is a brilliant and beautiful story, my friend. All right, thank you for being here, man. Everything good? Absolutely. Thanks for, for being with us, Jason. You're, you're amazing. <laughs> hey, man, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So here you go, man. The spot that you're in the hot seat now. One sentence. How would you describe The Way Back? All right. The Way Back is a spooky fantasy adventure that follows two Jewish teens, Bluma and Yehuda Leib, uh, on an adventure from their little village of Tupic through the far country to the house of death itself. Nailed it. It's like you've done this before, man. You, you, you nailed it, man. Four people before me, man. I had time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but look, man, I appreciate you being here, and I want to extend my congratulations to you. It's an honor, uh, and it's a privilege for me, but also it's just really cool to see such a talented person getting near to. So good, good on you, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Now, this is the part that uh, I know all of you are waiting for because this is the part where we'll get to do some q a some questions you didn't hear you didn't want to hear me yammer on and crack jokes uh or even one sentence sort of synopses of the books really what it's all about is making sure that you all have time to interact um you know our goal is to make sure that everybody gets a little bit of, uh, get some of the questions and everybody sort of spread out and that we get a few answers from a few people uh and so we're gonna just jump right in i uh let me see what we have here where I'm doing this, we're doing this all kinds of ways. Our technology is amazing. All right, let's get this started. Let's jump in. Um, um, I have technical difficulties with the live chat, right? So like, there's a lot going on. We're just like, I'm not sure that 
to happen or not yet, but that's what's supposed to be happening. We're going to set up an email address to make sure that students have a way to submit questions. Um, so that may be happening. Either way, there are some questions here, and we're going to roll with it regardless because that's just what we do. Um, so we'll start it out. Here we go. Uh, the first question, anybody can answer it. This is any of the authors. And I love this question, especially as it comes from young people. You know, it, it, this is like the the one question that I'm at, that we're always happy to hear a young person ask because it, it makes us feel like maybe they have curiosity about this thing, right? What made you want to become an author? Dun, dun, dun. It's like an obligatory question. What made you want to do it? And by the way, I want to know too because I know what it's like to be an author. Why would you ever want to do? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> what, made, <laughs> what made you want to become an author? <laughs> This is for anybody. Anybody can answer. I will go. Um, I wanted to become an author because of Final Fantasy VII, um, which I started playing when I was in middle school. And I got so enthralled with the idea of like this massive role playing game where the story was huge and the characters so were so interesting and so complicated. And I wanted to do that. And I didn't have access to to coding classes or anything at the time. And I was like, you know what? My favorite part about this is the story. And that is something I can do with just a pen and paper. And so I went in that direction. Um, instead of becoming a video game designer, I became an author. So that was my introduction um, <laughs> to writing. It's amazing. Anybody else? Thank yeah, um, my, my story is kind of similar. Um, I was super, I still am into anime. And I started out writing fan fiction when I was 10 years old. Right. <laughs> um, I just kept kind of going. Um, I think as I got older, I also wanted to see more representation for people that I never really get to see, like black, queer, trans people. So that kind of became a bit of a motivation to become a published author, too. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I feel like I became an author just because I had a lot to say. I grew up um, kind of like believing or being taught that young people should be quiet and they shouldn't um, they shouldn't talk back to adults and like I should keep my opinions to myself. And uh, yeah, like being an author gave me the opportunity to say things that I wasn't allowed to say as a kid and everybody has to listen to me because you're you're reading my story and so you're you're going through three, four hundred pages of something that's going on inside my head. And so, yeah, I was just drawn to the opportunity to get to like say something to a lot of people at once. Every kid is like, oh, boom, now I'm about to be a writer. I can say anything, mm -hmm. right, right. <laughs> yeah, you, weren't, you weren't, this isn't, this wasn't really your path, but it became your jam, so what happened? Yeah, so I was always a reader, right? Like, because reading is the best thing in the world and gives you the ability to like block out all the stuff that you don't <laughs> don't want to be seeing in your life. Um, and uh, I always enjoyed making up stories and thinking about stories, but what really finally spurred me to start writing, actually, this sounds weird, but it's true, uh, was boredom. I was bored. Uh, when you're an actor, you know, you have to wait for someone to give you permission to create stuff. Uh, and there's just so many people out there, particularly in New York, trying to create on the stage that, you know, you got to wait your turn. And I was tired of waiting my turn. Uh, so I, I decided, you know, I, this is this is a way that I can put down my stories and put down my thoughts and put down my opinions um, and, and share myself with the world where I don't have to wait for anyone to give me permission. You know what I mean? I'm just going to put it down. And then if people want it, they can pick it up. And there's there's a lesson there, young folks. Boredom is a gift. Boredom mm -hmm. is a gift. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I, as much as I love the cell phone and everything else, it is, it is sort of stripped of boredom. And and boredom is sometimes what, what drives our creativity. You know. Uh, and what about you guys, uh, Omar? What, what what made you all want to, Victoria Omar? What made you all want to do this? Uh, for me, as you said in the beginning, in, in your introduction, how a uh, teen conference was not available to you. At your time, books were not available. Me growing up in a refugee camp in Kenya. So there was no book of any type of that was, that was available to me. So this book was kind of an introduction to me. And it's a, a good start for me where I shared my personal story to introduce myself to the rest of the world. And I always say the main reason I wanted to start with my story is I wanted to be a voice for the voiceless. Those who are still in the refugee camp, those who are still struggling around, to, uh, around the world, seeking a refuge 
filling their country so and expect more from me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and I sort of came about it um, from a, a different way, just because I, I was an illustrator first, and I still think of myself more as an illustrator. And so I started writing books just because I wanted to draw certain things. Like my first picture book was about a pig in the Olympics. So I just wanted to draw a pig like ice skating. So I just decided to write the book so I could draw a pig ice skating. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm usually drawn by the illustrations and what I want to draw and just what I'm interested in and what captures my curiosity. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I want to make sure I shout out Lucas. Lucas is who asked that question to get us jumped off. Lucas, we appreciate you. Lucas, the International School of Brooklyn. Shout out to Brooklyn, New York. Shout out to you, Lucas. We appreciate you. Just so you all know, the email is set up. Please email questions at nationalbook.org. Questions at nationalbook.org. And we'll get all your questions and we'll, 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 we'll make sure we ask your questions. For all you teachers and young people out there, that's the email that you want to type into. It's questions questions at nationalbook.org. That's questions at nationalbook.org. All right, let's jump into another one. Here we go. From the class at the Young Women's Leadership School of Astoria. Shout out to Queens. Shout out to Queens. All right, from the, from the class of the Young Women's Leadership School of Astoria, this is a question for Candace. What were your personal experiences? that led you to write this book, AKA, please tell us all your business. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'll tell you some of my business. Um, I mean, I went to Howard University and it was like one of the most life-changing experiences that I've ever had because it was the first time I got to be away from home and make all my own decisions and meet all these people that I otherwise would have never come across. And I was inspired to just write a book about a black girl who is changed by the world when she thinks that she's going to be the one that changes everybody else. And so I was just like, yeah, I was inspired by having this experience where like for four to five years, I get to like be immersed in this super black culture um, of, on a campus where I am just like, I get to like learn how to be an adult and learn what I really feel, what I really, what I really like, what I'm inspired by, what I'm drawn to. And I had never seen a YA novel um, about college, um, like ever. I've never read one that was about college and about like, how chaotic and confusing that time is. And so, yeah, I wrote the book that like I crave. I craved knowing about like the drama of college and like what happens to you when you leave home. Awesome, awesome. I, you know, I, I, it's, I wanna say really quickly, I, I remember you working on this book and how that was such an interesting point about like, what about college? Like, can we touch on college and, and, and why does, why do you, why does young adult have to stop that? High school and everybody knows that that freshman year of college you are definitely still a young adult and all yes. the ways so, so i'm grateful for, for that this work being added into uh into this literary space uh all right from viviana and please i hope i'm pronouncing your name right viviana at the hamilton grange middle school i think i've been to hamilton grange shout out to hamilton grange at the hamilton grange middle school and this is a question for victoria how did you first meet omar and how did this book come about? I'm also very curious about this. I think we all are. <laughs> uh, well, it came about just because Omar and I met. I was visiting Omar's place of work, which is Church World Service in Lancaster, PA, which as Omar mentioned, is a place where new arrivals to the US can come for English lessons and help finding apartments. And I'm sure Omar can explain it better than me. And we just met that day. Um, a coworker introduced us and we just sat down to discuss possibly writing a book together and that's how it started do you want to add anything omar to that yeah uh, the only thing i will add is uh i had already a draft ready for adult version of my story so i i was more to, uh, want i wanted to write adult book which is still i'm uh, in the process of doing so but uh with the help of vicky convinced me to start with children's book and be more on graphic novel so that's amazing. It's amazing. I, I think all the time about, you know, places like Lancaster, PA, 
which I've been to a few times. Uh, I think about small towns like Seward, Nebraska, and I think about how I know most of the young people watching are either New Yorkers or or from Miami. You know, these are big cities, but there are small towns that are doing really incredible things uh, when it comes to the work of of of, of, of protecting and housing. Uh, refugees and I think we have to remember that the world is big and it's beautiful even the places that you least expect are still doing incredible things write no one off ever right write no town off right no space off right no person off um this next question is from Lily Lily at I preparatory academy this is a question for Omar actually you ready Omar you ready for this yeah. one <laughs> was life hard after moving to America and can you give us an update on your brother and family? And they, and they said, lots of students have asked whether you ever get to see your, whether you ever got to see your mother again. Yeah, so life, uh, you know, growing up in a refugee camp first, I would like to say one thing. People always hear about refugees, but we forget those who lost their life when they're seeking refuge. So I'm very fortunate that I was able to get the refuge I seek. I, I, I flee after fleeing from my country. Been over 17 years in that refugee camp. Coming to America was very, very hard because, you know, uh, everything was different. The food, the people, the language, the housing, everything. You have to restart from all what you have learned for, for over 17 years. There, nothing works here. Everything is totally different. So it was uh, relearning again and it was really, really hard. And I always say the most difficult time of me in the U.S. was the first two years in college because I had no friends, you know, in, uh, and I just happened to graduate from high school in, in a refugee camp. I never touched a computer, but I was admitted at University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. And then the first day I remember I went to statistics class with 500 students. I was really shocked because I had zero friends. I sit in there. And then I see here uh, students with snacks. I'm not used to that because in, in the refugee camp, you, if you eat one meal a day, you're very, you're very fortunate. That is the only food you get, one meal a day for 17 years. But in this overcrowded college where you see students, uh, uh, students running around with all these different things, I was still amazed. But life was really, really challenging. And that's why I choose to work as a resettlement case manager at Judge World Service. I don't want the newly arrived refugees struggle the same uh, the same struggle that I want to, because being a former refugee myself, being through what uh, what they they are going through right now, I I hope it makes uh, their struggle a little easier. I know I can't do everything, but I hope their uh, their struggle makes a little easier for them in transitioning to the. Even now, after twelve years in in the U.S., there's a lot to learn. I'm sometimes. This, I'm, I'm still in the process of learning the U.S. culture, and uh, it's always uh, in the. I'm always in the learning process too. Yeah. Brother, as somebody who's been in their whole lives, I'm still learning what it means to be here too, man. That's for sure. Um, I want to remind everyone one more time that if you do have questions, please email them to questions at nationalbook.org. That's question at nationalbook dot o-r-g this next question is for tracy and it's from the class at brooklyn prospect Shout out to brooklyn prospect did you have present day issues in mind when you were writing this story and how do they connect to the story yes i did have present day issues in mind i started research in earnest for we are not free in 2016, the summer before the election, um, and I was interviewing my relatives, getting their stories, and as I continued that throughout kind of the next year or so, and I started listening to these stories again, and kind of seeing that there was a pattern of injustice um, with people being put into detention centers now along the border um, and people being put into incarceration camps in the 1940s um, because of their race. Um, and I could not help but notice these things. And it was really interesting too, the way that current events in 2017, when I was hearing about the Muslim ban and so many 
so many young people being separated from their parents um, as they were trying to escape into this country. I didn't. There was a moment where I was listening to an interview with my great aunt again, and she mentioned how there were two girls in her neighborhood whose parents were Japanese teachers. They were kind of leaders in their community. And right after Pearl Harbor, these parents were taken away by the FBI, leaving these kids alone, kind of to be taken care of by the rest of the neighborhood. And this is not, I know this is not the same, but I could not help but think like the US government has been separating kids and families, uh, kids and parents for a very, very long time past you know the 1940s it goes way 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 back in our history and so these things are not new when they were happening in 2017 still happening now still happening kind of before the birth of this country to um enslaved families so i mean there's just i don't think that you can write about history without also writing about the present and i feel like that is a responsibility and also a gift to be able to do that for sure for sure, I appreciate that, Tracy, for sure. Uh, this one's for Gabrielle. And it's coming from Summer at the Young Women's Leadership School in East Harlem. Shout out to Harlem. Uh, and I love this question. And I, I'm so curious to see what you have to say. What was the weirdest place where you sat down to write this book? Ooh, that's a really good one. Um, so the way back, uh, has a lot of moving between uh, a place I call the far country and our world. Uh, and the far country is a sort of, uh, it's a land that's uh, populated with the spirits of the departed and with demons. And one of the ways that you reach the far country is through cemeteries, um, both the living and the dead. So I will tell you something. It sounds weird to say, but that is true. <laughs> Cemeteries are awesome. <laughs> cemeteries are like outdoor libraries, dude. Seriously, you walk through a cemetery. Firstly, they're usually beautiful, right? There's a lot of, you know, rolling green grass and beautiful trees, sometimes even like lakes. Um, and there, there are these little markers around made of stone that are sometimes statues, sometimes very simple, and they have names on them, names and dates. And that's often, all you get, and if, like me, you're someone with a tr troublesome, overactive imagination, you can't help but start thinking, oh my, yeah. I actually, last year, almost almost exactly a year ago, uh, I was in Indianapolis, and I went to a cemetery there, and I saw the best name on a headstone I've ever seen. Uh, the name was Emma Sells Graves. Um, and I don't know <laughs> how you could possibly not start thinking about Emma, who was in that grave, whose last name is Graves. Uh, but needless to say, I, I visited uh, several wonderful um, cemeteries while I was writing this book. And I even wrote in a few of them. Much of the book was written in New Haven, Connecticut, where I lived um, last year, or I guess a year and a half ago now. And there's a phenomenal cemetery in New Haven uh, called Grove Street Cemetery, uh, which has some very interesting people buried in it. It's, I think, the oldest um, graveyard in the United States that's not affiliated with the house of worship. Um, but in answer to your question, I'm the weirdo typing in the cemetery. <laughs> hey man, somebody got to be that guy. It might, <laughs> you might, as, well, it might as well be you. Uh, <laughs> um, at least, hey, listen, it, it would, if you weren't a finalist for the National Book Award, maybe we'd all be judging you. But you are, so it's kind of <laughs> like, eh, all, 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 all's going to well, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, this next question is from Kason. It comes from Janet at the Hamilton Grange Middle School. Was it hard to write such a sad story? And if so, what were the challenges you faced? Yeah, thank you for that question. <clears throat> it was really hard. Um, I think most of my books do deal with uh, traumas or wounds that the characters have to heal from. So for that reason, um, and a lot of those traumas kind of like link back to my own story. So it can be really hard. It can also be really therapeutic to write about um, those pains and to kind of like show the characters healing from them. Um, and also balancing that or making sure that I balance that with joy and making sure I balance that with humor and with love. 
Um, so in that way, it can be hard, but I think in the same way that it can be hard for all of us to kind of like heal from our own traumas, it can be difficult, but it can also be so beautiful if we can heal and grow from it and um, balance joy and love and happiness in our own lives too. For sure, for sure. I thought that book, I thought there were moments of sadness in your book, but it did to me, for me, it didn't feel like a sad book, you know, um, for me, it felt like, uh, and I hate when publishers or viewers say this, like a book, a book filled with heart, but it kind of is a fair way to, to, to sort of talk about it, uh, some of these stories that it is a, a heart there's a heart to the book how about that there's a heart to the book that i that i really appreciate not just a weight to the book you know thank you um all right this is for everybody uh from the class at city at school which is about by the way i don't know where city at school is but that sounds amazing and i probably need to come and check y'all out see as school it's in manhattan shout out to manhattan shout out to new york city uh did you see your writing this is for anybody and everyone do you see your writing as a form of activism yes for me <laughs> thanks omar omar came through and omar said yes <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I just want to be, uh, uh, and I always uh, mess up my book with my refugee work, and I always, because it ends up the same, because my book is about my personal life, growing up in a refugee camp. So yes, my book is about, uh, I just want to educate uh, others about who those refugees are that we always hear. Because, uh, you know, and uh, if you want to know one thing about those refugees, know this, which is no one chooses to be a refugee. No one, and that's the last thing any human being wants is to leave their home, which they have all everything, and flee to a refugee camp, grow up in a refugee camp. So yes, my work is activism, and my book is about educating others about who those refugees are. Yeah, I think mine is as well. And I wonder, um, I mean, it's okay if people disagree with this, but I wonder if almost every book is an act of activism, as long as it's telling the truth about what's happening in our current world. I kind of feel like um, telling the truth in itself is a form of activism, but I wonder what other people think. I, I agree with that. That's why I think when I was thinking about the question just now, I wasn't sure how to answer it, but I, it does feel like in 2020, um, now it really does feel like it's an act, it is activism to tell the truth and to shed light on something that people misconstrue or they don't know enough about or that the vast majority is ignorant about. Um, but I also, I don't know, I feel like activism is also really intentional when it comes to um, bringing awareness to a certain issue and I think that my book is more so bringing an awareness to what's going on inside of a person and how it connects to those issues on the outside. And so I, I don't think that that's what the goal was, but I think like by your, um, your definition, I think I agree. Like I've, I've never been able to put it into words in that way. I agree with Candace. I feel like art and activism have common goals, but they're not identical all the time. I, you know, certainly art has pieces, specific pieces of art have changed my experience. Um, but I don't know that they change things at like massive political levels, the way that activism uh, aims to do. Uh, I think they, they change things at individual levels, right? We, we as, as novelists try and get inside of like one little piece of humanity and show it to others, which is, aimed at broadening, you know, the understanding and the love in the universe, but it's not the same as like aiming at political change, I don't think. So I think in some ways, activism and art share a lot of DNA, but aren't identical. Do, do other people agree with that? Yes. And this is what I was going to say. I don't feel like the work is the same. And this is my hesitation. I still feel very new on my journey towards becoming an activist or, or more politically active. And so I don't feel like I can claim like, yes, my art is activism because I, I don't want to undersell the work that political activists are doing out there 
you know, on the phones, knocking door to door, you know, in town halls. That that is not the same as what I am doing. Although I do agree with Kason, um, and I'm glad you brought this up. That like everything that you create is kind of a political statement about what the world is, or or what it should be, or or both at the same time. And to say like this is truth to to your point, Candice, is is really saying what you believe about the world and what you believe about people. And I think that's that is important. Yeah. It's fascinating. I, I agree with all of you as well. I mean, I think I think it's interesting though, because I think that sometimes uh, right, that, that the idea that we live political lives whether we want to or not. Um and sometimes just entering uh, a narrative into a space where that narrative has not existed is a political statement and it uh, is it, it, it comes with activation right? it is activated uh, even if even if it wasn't the intention for it to be activated once it, it's like it's like putting something in a pot of boiling water we don't know what reaction it will have once it touches the water right but we know that the pot needs this season right and i'm going to put this season in the pot and i don't know I was going to change the flavor of the stew, but I'm going to put this season in the pot because I know it belongs in the pot and that the pot is missing something. We don't know the reaction that the water is going to have on the season. And that's not up to us, but it's up to us to make sure to recognize when the, when the, when the stew is missing a season. Right? And that is an active thing to be able to do. You know, so it's, it's, it's an interesting question that we could go on forever about. And shout out to the young folks. Uh, who, who, let me make sure I get who asked that question. Oh, all the youngins at city at school. I think that's something that we all should be asking ourselves regularly. Like, what what is activism? What is political? What is is authenticity even a thing? Uh oh. Can't hear you. Am I back? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. These are all complicated questions that are important to ask ourselves, especially as all of you continue to grow and become leaders in our in our world. Um, all right, next up, Isabella. My mama's name is Isabella. So we're so close that I already love you. Isabella at our preparatory academy. This one is for you, Candice. Why did you choose to write the novel in verse? Uh, I mean, simply stated, that's how the story came to me. Uh, my first, like my introduction to writing in college um, by the hands of like a friend, a friend, um, was like, she introduced me to poems. Like I first learned about poems as an avenue to express different feelings. And then like along my journey, I started to like read, uh, different genres of work. And I really liked fiction. Also, I realized I liked telling stories. I liked unpacking like why a person is the way that they are. And then um, I came across Jacqueline Woodson's um, Brown Girl Dreaming. And that was when I discovered that I could merge the two worlds that are in me in a book. And so like my love of storytelling with the fact that like I see a lot of things in poem uh, made telling it in verse like just unavoidable. Like I had to tell a story this way. Um, I couldn't even imagine it as a book that is written in prose. Shout out to the great Jacqueline Listen, I'm sure all of us would agree, a juggernaut in our world. Um, sheesh. All right, three more questions left, and then we got a boogie. Um, this one is for everyone. Uh, by the way, when we say for everyone, you all don't have to feel the need. Everyone doesn't have to answer if you don't want to. Uh, but if you have an answer, please feel free to, to, to set forth. Uh, what was your favorite book? Actually, you know what? This one isn't a book. This is a question that you all have to answer, actually. What was your... I, <laughs> What was your favorite book as a young person? I can go first because I always answer the same thing, which was um, the Ramona Quimby books by Beverly Cleary. Those are the books I took out of the library over and over and over and over again. And even as a grown up, I reread them. I just love her simplicity of language and how she speaks honestly to kids. Mm, I I really, really, really loved Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Like <laughs> to me, that is that is still one of the best picture books out, and I still revisit it a lot. Uh, my answer is a little sad. Um, and I was trying to think if I could like 
pretend it wasn't Harry Potter, but it is Harry Potter. And it's sad for me right now because um, I mean, that book and those series were my entire life really. Um, and JK Rowling has turned out to be quite transphobic. So it's a sad answer for me, but it's the truth nonetheless. I really loved Watership Down by Richard Adams. It's about rabbits. Um, and I reread that book every year because it is just, it's so epic and so engaging. And I love that there are stories within stories, like the rabbits are storytellers, which is really, really cool. Similarly, my favorite, uh, well, I, I, I hate this favorite books thing. That's not how books work. But <laughs> one of the ones that really turned my brain on. Uh, was a book called Moss Flower by Brian Jakes, which also uh, features uh, animal protagonists and in this like kind of crazy fantasy medieval world. You know, they got, it's mouses with swords. What, who doesn't love that? I love uh, Mariel of Redwall. Totally. <laughs> with a, weapon, with a, a rope with a knot at the end. <laughs> Imagine you had a book when you were younger. I will skip this one because I didn't have books when I was growing up. So I'm in the process of nope. no more books now. No problem, man. Me neither. Yeah, for me, they differently, but I didn't find any books. I was much, much older. I want to take this time to shout out uh, the great Renee Watson, though, because uh, Victoria, you, you said that Ramona Quimby and Renee Watson has a series featuring a little black girl in the same world that Ramona Quimby lives in. Shout out to Portland, Oregon. Uh, so shout out to that book. Wow. So yeah, buddy. Yeah, oh, my buddy. God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. We have time for two more from Cheyenne at the Young Women's Leadership School in East Harlem for everyone. How does creativity come into play when writing a book with a personal connection to you? That's a good question. Mm, I'll I, I repeat it. I'll repeat the question. Make, make sure. How does creativity come into play when writing a book with a personal connection to you? I I think um, I feel like creativity comes into play when writing a really personal um, story, in the sense, or I guess where you would like to have fun. I guess so. I guess what I'm trying to say is that creativity comes into play for me in writing a personal story um, by creating a like a fun way for me to engage the subject matter, um, mainly like. I've heard a lot of people describe my story as heavy or hard hitting or searing. And I feel like if I hadn't thought about a interesting way to convey it on the page, it may have had a different effect on the readers. And so I feel like having a creative mind and thinking of like new ways of presenting a story that may otherwise feel really hard to read or hard to write is really important. Um, like that's what I learned from just even becoming a poet is like, how can I, how can I, how can I go beyond just telling the truth or just telling the story? Like, how do I, how do I engage a reader in a way that's like fun and does something else to their brain besides just give them words? Mm. Anyone else? Yeah, I think for me, because we are not free is inspired by my grandparents and my great uncles and aunts stories, but not my stories. My experience was a little bit different in that I tried really hard to get at kind of the heart of what happened to them, the the root of their experiences. And I really, the creativity I think came in trying to be as respectful of those experiences and the people who lived them while also trying to been an entertaining um, and engaging tale for for young people in the 21st century. I mean that that took a little bit of of, of weaving to get through, but I hope it worked out. It seems to me like the question is implying that somehow uh, creativity and personal experience are like opposites. And if I'm understanding correctly, I want to flip that idea on its head because in my experience any act of storytelling like when you're sitting at lunch and telling what happened that morning that's a creative act because anytime we figure out how re like events are related in our minds that's a creative act mm -hmm. um so i think there's creativity everywhere that you might not necessarily be noticing because it sort of creeps into the background and so i want to invite you all to try and figure out where the creativity is sneaking in and 
and you're not seeing it because it's everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere. <laughs> Any last people? Is that it? Because I got one more question. You sure you don't want to answer? Is everybody good? I'm good. All right, here we go. Last question. And this is from Amy at I Preparatory Academy, and this is for everyone. And this is for everyone. <laughs> if, if there was one piece of it, advice that you could give to an aspiring author what would it be y'all act like y'all haven't heard this question before That's my <laughs> i just don't want to say the same thing that i say every single time that's all what's the it's same true. thing you say every single time it doesn't have to be your answer and i'm curious <laughs> i mean i would give i always would just say like an aspiring author has to be willing to try, like you have to be willing to um, try that thing out that's in your head, even if it seems really ridiculous, that a lot of times that ends up being the thing that people really like about your story or about um, how you deliver your story is if, yeah, like I just have, I've heard, I've, I've seen a lot of just like stories and ideas get ruined because a person just like deads it before they even see what it looks like on a page. And I, so I, I just really encourage you to, to just believe, like try to, try to, try to accept the idea that what you create and your ideas, that the fact that they matter, um, bef like just from jump. So that way you get it out of the way, like whether or not you should put it out into, to, to the world, like just start there, start there with knowing that like, I have to try it out to even see if it's something worth finishing. Yeah, and that's where my advice usually, that I usually give to kids is not to be afraid to follow whatever that impulse is that you wanna tell a story about, no matter if it seems weird or niche, to not be afraid to follow your passions. Like I wrote a book about ice skating pigs, as I said, and roller derby. So whatever that weird love or interest or curiosity you have, like explore it. It doesn't, you don't know where it's gonna end up, but don't be afraid to explore it and see where it leads you. I've got two uh, and they kind of go hand in hand. So I'm going to say two instead of one. My two are always keep learning and hold fast. And I feel like they go together because if you approach anything, it's it could be writing, it could be something else with this growth mindset of, you know, there's always something I could be doing better. There's always something I could, I could learn from. There's another class to take. There's um, another book to read. There's another friend I could make that could teach me something. I feel like that will help you to really understand what is in you to write. What is the thing that is in you to make that nobody else can make? And that is the thing that you have to hold fast to. That is, I think, the thing that, that Candace is talking about, maybe. The thing that you need to bring out into the world. And you will know that if you if you are always kind of on this path of, of learning and improving and, and developing new ways of, of doing your craft. So always keep learning and also hold fast. And along those lines, I feel like we're all um, called to write because we all have a message to give. And I think it's important to stay true to the authenticity of that message and to stay true to the truth that is inside of you, if that makes any sense, to, to not be afraid to tell your own story. For me, writing is uh, a very simple, but not a very easy process. I think they're very different things, simple and easy. Uh, and writing for me boils down to three steps, which is to say, try it out, finish it, and then make it better. And all three of those are equally important. You gotta start, and then you gotta finish a draft, because if you don't finish a draft, you don't know what you're looking at. And then if you don't go back and make it better, then it can always be better. You know what I mean? You're leaving something on the table. So try it out, finish it, make it better. Also, uh, as a new person to this field, uh, one thing I've realized is there's always a struggle, anything you want to do in this world. It's not like easy thing, I want to do this, you know, this no, it doesn't work that way. So never give up hope. If Be committed to what you want to do. If you want to, if you want to do this, be committed. If, I never ever give up hope of anything you want to do. Shout out to you, brother. I appreciate that. So listen, we're at the end of our time here, and I want to say very briefly to all the young people who are tuned in and who are watching, um, one, uh, that we love you, that we are grateful for you, two, that what an opportunity you've had to interact and engage 
with the people who are writing books um, uh, for you and, and that make you, hopefully that make you feel seen and make you feel big in the world. But the thing I want you to remember is that it's not that these people are just writing the books that make you feel big in the world, it's that you actually exist in these people's minds. You live in their minds. Right? And that's an amazing thing for you all to remember. It's even more important than the things that they make to know that you exist in the minds of many, many, many of us who love you and carry you with us everywhere you go. I hope you all have had an amazing time. I want to give a shout out to Gabrielle, to Kaysen, to Omar, to Tracy, Candace, Victoria, my guy Jason down there getting busy with the hand magic. You know what I mean? We appreciate you, brothers. <laughs> shout out to the Miami, to Miami. Shout out to my people's Lisa Lucas. Shout out to the National Book Foundation. I want to remind everybody that this year, the uh, National Book Awards, it's on Wednesday, a couple days. I'm your host, which means it's probably going to be a lot of cutting up uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, everybody is welcome. Uh, there will be a link that will be somewhere. It's not going to go in the chat, I don't think. But there, you can go online to the National Book Foundation or National Book Awards and you can find it. Um, I appreciate y'all for tuning in. And I'm going to holler at y'all soon. Be safe. Wear your mask and watch your hands. Talk soon, y'all. Mm -hmm. Peace. Thank mm -hmm. you.